in this text, you know, this is a very... The, the text we just read, excuse me, the, the um, literature on the right to death, this is an account of writing which it belongs very much to the time of the, the writing of the space of literature. It's an account of writing that gives us a, an account of the solitude of the writer entering this other space, this space of literature. And solitude is a big theme for him in, in this time. But, again, solitude, as he understands it in this literary experience, or, uh, this experience of literature, is, is not a foreclosure of other relations. And so when he brings in this relation to the other human being, it's not as though he's, he's turning to something he's forgotten, you know, or, or, or that, that he's refused and suddenly he opens it up to it. But, but at the same time, I have to say, I'm, something I, I, I'm not quite sure how to, how to answer. How do, we, how do we accommodate with this the thinking that we've just been reading and this whole motif of the solitude of the writer? How do we accommodate that with this question of the presence of the other? Now, we can, um, one way of, of tracking this issue or, or you know, of, of seeing where it presents itself is in the relation to Levinas. And as soon as he starts talking about Levinas, he's talking about the other. But prior to the great texts on Levinas, which are of the 60s, um, and I don't, I don't know when Blanchot really re-engaged with Levinas, I don't know the date of that. I, I heard from Mikael Levinas, uh, Levinas' son, that um, when he was a kid, and, and he's got to be uh, at least 50, he said when he was a kid, Blanchot was frequently at the house. <laughs> When was that? I don't, you know, I don't know exactly. Now, when did Blanchot start reading Levinas in a way that uh, that allowed for this? You know, when when in the infinite, in the opening texts of the infant conversation, Blanchot says in an unreserved way, "This is the most important thing that has happened in philosophy, and this is the path we have to take now." And, and so, he's, and he's referring to totality and infinity and, uh, and Levinas's writings. So I, I don't know when this. When this happens, so to speak, or how exactly it takes form. He had been friends with Levinas since the 20s. I mean, this is a very long-standing relation. Why it, it, it intercedes, as it does, in the late 50s, early 60s, I, I don't know. But um, there is another uh, voice here to be taken into account, and that is the voice of Bataille. And Blanchot had been meditating on his relation to Bataille under the, under the term of friendship. Um, in the book, L'Amitié, this means friendship, there is a there is a text, an absolutely astonishing text, of a commemorative text, in which he talks about his friendship with um, Bataille and what friendship meant. And there he talks about um, relating to the other, uh, relating to the other in their dying. I mean, we have just followed a dying of the author in in this relation to literary language, and and he, and he suggests that the relation between two human beings is a relation between one dying and the other exposed to that dying. Bataille had said, we are, we are never drawn out from ourselves except when we are exposed to the, the dying of the other. But, and Blanchot is working in a very similar way. So he is, um, he sees in the, he, he stages, I mean, well, you take a text like Death Sentence, and again, I, dates are escaping me, early 50s. Um, can someone look that up quickly on their computer, when Death Sentence is? Yes. To Bataille. Yeah. What is it called? French. The essay is called L'Amitié, Friendship. Um, L'Amitié. Well, no, the whole book is called L'Amitié. It has a lot of different essays, but the essay on Bataille, which is near the end of the book, is called L'Amitié. Yes? 1948. 48, yeah, okay. I'm so bad with data. I have to check this over and over again. But uh, 1948, Death Sentence is all about the relation with that. Um, and it stages um, uh, a couple scenes of dying, uh, of being exposed to the death of the other, and what this does to the narrator as he is um, in this in this relation with the, the dying other. Now, in I wanted to um, start in talking about the dialogue from the infant conversation with a couple of references to Bataille, or to what Blocher says about Bataille. But let me just, in relation to what we're talking about now. Um, Blanchot constructs repeatedly 
scenes of dying in which one slips from, slipping from the world of the day, dying in a, in a uh, dying sometimes in a, you might say, a strict sense of the word, but frequently this apparent strict sense is suspended or, or undone by the other sense which we have uh, followed in literature and the right to death. So that, that it is that the one, one attends another who is slipping from the world. Okay? Let's just put it that way. And Blanchot describes in, in these scenes of dying how this, how this failing, this, this falling away, this, you know, the failing is défaillance, uh, this falling away, this dying from the world and from our everyday relations with the other, which can be you know, relations of, of sexual intimacy and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> how, how this other so escapes from a relation of self to self. And in that, in that retreat, draws the self attending the other out of itself. So there, the, the self who, who is with the other dying is exposed in and by that dying to their own dying, in some sense. Right? So there is a dying with the other. That, that form of now, this is not an entry into some form of intimacy. Um, and it can be, um, you know, Blanchot describes it, there's a passage in, in The Step Not Beyond where he talks about it as a, as, as a shocking experience a sh and, and shockingly violent. And so it's, it's not, this is not a, it's not uh, simply, you know, describing how we might become closer to the other in this passage, but it's rather a suspension of the self and a becoming other um, on the part of each. So each, and if we use the language living us, each becomes autrui for the other. Each becomes other for the other. But Blanchot also describes in this, and this is where it gets so very complicated in Blanchot, um, that in this scene of dying, there's the opening of a, well, there's an exteriority, a kind of exposure to, to exteriority. And there is the exposure of what... There's, a, there's an exposure of exteriority itself in the relation. And so there is, it's, it's like a third instance starting to appear, only this is an alterity. And this is where I was situating the Eden and um, talking about the, the encounter in the desert uh, two nights ago. Um, now, that is in, you know, as I say, he stages scenes of dying. He also stages scenes of conversation. And in that conversation, which is, um, you know, conversation that we'll see, um, and which is in part based on these conversations with Bataille, he talks about a way in which, again, a self is slipping from the world, in some sense, that uh, there is an exposure to alterity, another attends that slippage, and in that uh, common experience of an alterity, um, something else begins to manifest itself. Blanche, uh, Bataille calls this a thought, and Blanche takes over that notion. A thought starts to occur. There is, in the, um, in the intimacy of this exteriority, as he puts it, um, a, the, another presence, or, or, or he calls it a presence of a thought. And so, in a, in a conversation, we'll see this happen in a conversation that I, that I want to read with you, um, the, the relation between two becomes a relation to a third, more than, more than a third, finally. Um, there's a, a kind of multiplication of voices that occurs, but initially there is a, the conversation becomes another conversation and that another is involved. And th that is, in, in a death sentence, you'll see, um, you'll see this appear when he starts, when he, when he talks about his relationship with a woman, he's, he starts conflating that woman with something he calls a thought. And at the end of the text, he's, Having, he's affirming his relation with a thought, which is obscurely in relation with a woman. You know, so it, it's, it's, um, it's an extremely complicated structure whereby passage beyond the, let's say, the hold of the self with another, in what I'm calling this dying with, is also to <coughs> say a, the birth of a thought. And he is trying to think He's trying to think that thought. 
trying to um, he's trying to engage that thought in his writing, and it's in that movement that we have this other affirmation that I've been talking about that, that other term. Blanchot is Blanchot, This is from a, a text in the Infinite Conversation where Blanchot is trying to talk about what it was like to, to have these conversations with Bataille, and he says that Bataille's language led him to the following description of what was occurring in Bataille's speech and in Bataille's work in general. He, he writes the following, and he, it's about language. He says, speech entertains what no existent being in the primacy of their own name can attain. So, when we, when we are involved with language, so to speak, we, we are involved with something beyond ourselves. And this again relates to this movement beyond the hold of the self. Speech entertains what no existent being in the primacy of their own name can attain. When we are really speaking in this strong sense, we are beyond ourselves and our name. What existence itself and the seduction of its fortuitous particularity and the play of its slipping universality could never hold within itself. And not only does speech retain what decidedly escapes in this manner, but it is on the basis of this always foreign and furtive affirmation, the impossible and the incommunicable, that it speaks, finding there its origin, just as it is in this speech that thought thinks more than it can. So, speaking maintains a relation with something that is other for us. Maintains a relation with this other presence that is there as a kind of affirmation. But I call this the impossible. So speech exceeds us, and in speech there is this presence of another, which is, as he says, it's the presence of, a, of, a, of an affirming thought, as I said a moment ago, or um, and, and something communicating itself, but in an incommunicable manner. So, let me read that sentence again. And not only does speech retain what decidedly escapes in this manner, but it is on the basis of this always foreign and always furtive affirmation. So it's, it's a, this otherness is affirming itself in the retention, that it speaks. Finding there its origin, speech finds its origin in this relation to alterity, just as it is in this speech that thought thinks more than it can. And no doubt this is not just any speech. It does not contribute to discourse. It does not add anything to what has already been formulated. It would only wish to, it, it would wish only to lead to what outside of all community would come to communicate itself if, finally, when everything was consummated, there was nothing more to say, saying then the ultimate exigency. So there is, um, there is constantly in, in, in the infinite conversation this effort to think in the presence of speech, um, the, the, this affirmation of an alterity, or the presence of an alterity, which he sometimes thinks is a thought, sometimes he thinks as a, as a communication of the incommunicable or the impossible. Um, these pages on Bataille are really quite beautiful, but let me, let me read another couple, couple pages. He's talking about the way in which there was in Bataille's way of speaking a strange precaution and an awareness of speech. And he, he goes on to, this, to, to comment on this. He says, what is present in this presence of speech, as soon as it affirms itself, so when, when Bataille's speech sort of calls attention to itself as speech, when it moves beyond this, this the name, you know, and, and becomes this other speaking. What is present in this presence of speech, as soon as it affirms itself, is precisely what never lets itself be seen or attained. Something is there that is beyond reach. It is between us. It holds itself between, and conversation is approach on the basis of this between two, an irreducible distance that must be preserved if one wishes to maintain a relation with the unknown that is the unique gift of speech. So again, another way of talking about this presence of an affirmation is relation with the unknown. What are the pages? Are there this is an infra infinite conversation, yeah. page 212. 212, and the one before that? Um, pretty close, that would be 210 and 11. So, there's what Blanchot is interested in in conversation, entre, tiens, holding, between, is what holds itself between in conversation. And the movement of conversation that he's seeking is movement back to that, that 
other <laughs> that holds itself between by virtue of this speaking relation. Now he describes, uh, I'm going to give you one more citation on this experience of Bhattai's speech. He says, <clears throat> he says that the real site of conversation is a mutual attention on the part of the two speakers. So he says, what solicits thought is always the non-familiar. That's what Bhattai solicited in us when he would speak or engage that relation. There is no relation, there is no recognition of what thought aims for in us. Each time there is a new beginning and a decision to offer itself up to the non-known whose intention thought sustains. There's a kind of sacrifice there. You know, to offer oneself up to this otherness. And yet this non-familiarity -familiar that the strangeness in speech preserves is also the intimacy of thought. It passes by way of this abrupt and silent, I mean implicit, intimacy that is destined to open within the known and frequentable space between two interlocutors, another space where habitual possibilities steal away. This other space, opened by the non-familiar intimacy of thought, is the space of attention. But let us specify immediately that it is not simply an attentive listener of whom the one speaking would have need. The attention is between the one and the other. So it's as though the attention that the speakers bring consciously to the conversation in, a, you know, in an effort uh, of real, uh, an attempt to honor what happens in conversation, um, it, it's not their attentiveness, it's another attentiveness that opens within the conversation. It's an attentiveness that belongs to this, what he calls this, um, this intimacy of, of a non-familiar space. So the attention belongs to this other thought that I've been referring to, which is opening or which is presenting itself in the space between two speakers. Let us specify immediately, I'm reading again, that it is not simply an attentive listener of whom the one speaking would have need. This attention is between the one and the other, center of the encounter, sign of the between two that brings close as it separates. Attention empties the sight of all that encumbers it and renders it visible. Hence that strange vacancy in Blanchot's um, narratives, the strange emptiness that, of these... Usually the action happens in rooms in an undefined hotel or, or dwelling place that's not a home. It's a very, very empty space. And as he proceeds, he empties it out more and more, trying to enter this site that he's describing in relation to these conversations with that time. Attention empties the site of all that encumbers it and renders it visible. This is a profound and at, time, at times painfully hollowed out absence on the basis of which and in coinciding with which, the presence of speech is able to affirm itself. In the sense that this attention is the attention of no one, it is impersonal. But it is also, through speech and beyond those who are there, the waiting for what is in play, through speech, between those who are there. So, it's a space of attention and, and a space of waiting. And a waiting, a waiting, or a waiting, occurs. And insofar as the selves are carried beyond themselves in this attention, they are also forgetting themselves. Hence, it is a space of waiting and forgetting. I'm, I'm citing Blanchot's famous book, L'Attente L'Oubli, the waiting, the forgetting. So, the literary practice that Blanchot is attempting is a movement back into this space of waiting. This, as I say, hollows out this space um, and allows this other uh, presence, this other thought, this other relation, to, to manifest itself. I'm going to cite one last thing and then we'll go to that conversation. He says, you know, so, so there's, the opening of a, there's an opening of a thinking beyond what either of the interlocutors can think on their own, or an opening of thought to that which exceeds their thinking. And he says, but this doesn't happen without a certain commitment on the part of each of them. So, so I'm just citing, he says, Yet this attention also responds to an accord between two beings, each one carried by the decision to sustain the same movement of research, and thus to be faithful, without faith and without guarantee, to the same rigorous movement. So there is a, there is a commitment here in, in the act of writing. There is a commitment in this act of speaking. There is, a, there is a, an, an effort, if you will. 
Here a mutual promise is made that commits the play of thought to a common openness in this game, in which the players are two speaking beings and through which thought is each time asked to affirm its relation to the unknown. So there, there's a, a tension, which is the condition of a conversation in which thought would come into relation with the unknown in another form of tension. Okay? This is the text, by the way, that, that um, as I said, it, it's at the very beginning of the infinite conversation. It does not appear in the table of contents. Um, and then the text, throughout its movement, appears almost to be reflecting on this text. It appears almost as though a lot of the infinite conversation is a commentary on this text. Or perhaps it's the other way. Perhaps this text writes what has happened in the thinking in the infinite conversation. So it's an extremely complex relation between a reflective, meditative, uh, theoretical writing and a literary writing. And this is, I, I would say, intensely literary in its relation to fragmentation and interruption and in the way in which it, it plays with language uh, in a way that is not incommensurate or, or is not, 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 uh, not without relation to what we were reading in Literature and the Right, the right to Death. But as I say, it, is, it, is, it, 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 it occupies a strange liminal space in the infinite conversation, and it's, um, it is itself almost like um, an epigraph, or um, you know, a, a kind of entry into that space, um, which, which will then resonate with, or it's an opening in that space, which will then resonate with, with echoes um, throughout the almost 600 pages that follow. It's, it's, it's a quite, from a textual point of view, this is a very, very interesting. Um, in keep it, or in first step, in, 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 uh, in entering the space of those many. Um, <coughs> so we have then immediately um, this evocation of a, of, a, of a commitment. His feeling, each time he enters and when he studies the robust and courteous, already aged man who tells him to enter, rising and opening the door for him, is that the conversation began long ago. A little later, he becomes aware that this conversation will be the last. Hence the kind of benevolence that emerges in their talk. Have we not always been benevolent? Always. Yet we are asked to bring proof of a more perfect benevolence, unknown to us as yet. A benevolence that would not be limited to ourselves. Nor that is content with extending itself to everyone, but maintains itself in face of the event in regard to which benevolence would not be fitting the event that we promised to evoke today. As always, one of the two awaits from the other a confirmation that, in truth, does not come, not because accord would be lacking, but because it was given in advance. This is the condition of that conversation. So this, um, uh, this, I think this evokes the um, you know, commitment that I just read in, uh, in Blanchot's uh, description of the relation to Bataille. And the, the project, the project. I mean, this is why, because of this commitment, he can t talk about research. He can talk about um, the, a long path. He says this at the beginning of the, um, the step not beyond. That when writing presents itself as an exercise to him, he set out. He sets out on a, on a, on a, on a path, a kind of task. An exigency opens, and he will answer that exigency for the rest of his life. A constant um, effort go farther, to open more to this relation that he's trying to think. And, and that's, again, a, a, you know, a dimension of this problem of passivity and activity. How do we understand if, you know, if there's such a passivity in this uh, experience of writing, how do we understand his continuing? <laughs> Why does he go on? What, what impels to write? Of course, he talks about an agency and an ethical agency and so forth, but um, what, what, what how do we describe the writer's own relation to this event? And clearly, he's, he understands that there's some kind of commitment that, that, is, um, that is called for and, um, and is also, in some, to some extent, the condition of this, of this practice. So it is not entirely irresponsible in that sense. I love the, the way in which the, the understanding here, um, uh, which... Uh, Accord is, is it names it, um, entente is the word, um, which is also a, a hearing. <clears throat> As always, one of the two awaits from the other a confirmation that in truth has not come, not because accord would be lacking, but because it was given in advance. 
So one is left waiting for an accord that the other has already given. It's, they're in a kind of disjunctive relation. Um, but the accord has perhaps already been given to the conversation itself, as opposed to the other individual. So they're, they're, in, a, they're in slightly different spaces. It's a slightly uh, heterogeneous relation. <clears throat> and of course you recognize that we're in a, we're in a structure of repetition. This, uh, this conversation is happening, is happening again in a, in a space of rep repetition. Though, this one is perhaps the last one, or it's asserted that he becomes aware that this conversation will be the last. And so we're in a position perhaps not unlike the, um, the situation of the speaker in the madness of the day. When I die, perhaps any minute now, and going forward with that sense of an imminent end or an imminent passing. But this last conversation, we'll, we'll find out very shortly that th both of them are too tired to carry it forward. So um, within moments they'll be rescheduling this last conversation. Um, but this last con conversation is devoted to, to evoking an event. Something has happened. And they are called upon, they are called upon in this conversational relation. They're called upon, called upon to find a relation to this event, which they initially called benevolence, a benevolent, a more perfect benevolence, but which they recognize is cannot quite be fitting, or meet, as we'd say in archaic English, cannot quite be fitting for the event, because there is no appropriate relation to the event on the part of a, a self giving something to another as you know, kind of care or a kind of attention. Benevolence is a beautiful word because it has ben, benevol, you know, the bene of, of, it evokes a kind of good. If we go back from the etymology, we also cross uh, a notion of the beautiful. Um, but um, benevolent, or there's, a, there's a goodness or a caring, um, and at the same time there is, we hear benevolent, we hear willing, which is a, um, which also echoes with veille, which is to watch over in, in French. So there is a watching over with a, 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 a goodness uh, um, evoked. Veille is to watch over, and it's also to wait. So waiting is already being named here in this benevolence. But even this term that he calls benevolence is not quite adequate to this event because this event is, exceeds in relation to any individual or any, any relation. It, it, it doesn't, it, it, one can't be faithful to what, what he will come to call the neutral. When there's, there's no, the relation to the neutral has to be without relation. One, one cannot bring that alterity into relation, even with good intent. Like this, this suspends any, any such relationality. Now, it becomes important, initially as we read this text, it, it really sets a scene for us. We, we have a sense of a, of a coherent narrative um, and a, a set of events, so to speak. But one has to be very attentive, I think, to these, um, to these signs, uh, these, these graphic marks of interruption. But, and as we proceed, you'll see, actually, you'll see pretty quickly that um, the that these, these passages don't always follow one another. Or rather that the, t the temporality of this encounter is, is in some fundamental way disrupted or distended. So um, we're, in, we're in a space of return, as, as we've already noted, and the time of that return is not, not very clear. Um, so we have some passages which are clearly before the ones that preceded in terms of any uh, dating that one might exercise. So, um, so one has to be very attentive to the break, but at the same time, sometimes it appears that there's a kind of an immediate um, relation between the previous part and the part that follows. And that it introduces a, a singular uh, ambiguity into the text. I mean, you simply do not know if there is a relation between sections, or you cannot affirm it so simply. There's, there's an apparent relation, but it's not, um, it, it's, it's not secure. So. Um, this text absolutely refuses any kind of um, narrative construction. 
you know, and we're in the same space. A story? No, no stories. This is not a story. Not if we accept, well, not if we demand of a story that it, it entail this coherent relation between the beginning and the end and follow as a series of events where we can assign causes and effects and so on and so forth. Um, there is a kind of um, there is a kind of narrative here, and I, I want to try to point to this uh, with you. I want to follow it with you, <clears throat> but it doesn't um, it, it doesn't obey a, a linear form, and and so we are, we are, and 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 ultimately it doesn't hold. You know, if I can if I can give you a narrative here, I can't I can't secure it. It's 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 open to other other paths and, and other relations. But there is something like a, um, a, a path here, and, and I would, just to give you a suggestion right at the outset, what, what but, uh, Blanchot evoked in his relation to Bataille in those conversations is engaging with speech in such a way as to engage another speaking, which would be a communication of the incommunicable or the impossible. Right? And so if, if the idea is to approach that which is between the two, and to find a way to inhabit that space of attention and waiting um, in such a way as to bring that affirmation forward or to bring that thought into, into proximity to us, maybe think it in some way, um, then the, the process of conversation is a, m a kind of moving back into speech or moving back toward what speaks in speech. And so in that way, it is, um, it, the first part of this text anyway, does appear to be something like a, a being on the way toward language. Right? And it's, it's this, in a similar, similar kind of movement to, to what we see in Heidegger, Untilet Sushpa, but on the way to this other speech that he has designated, which is profoundly different from Heidegger in many respects. But there is a kind of um, a homology here, if I may, um, in terms of the movements of the texts. Um, Heidegger, um, Blanchot is underway in a way that is really um, quite comparable to Heidegger's being un, on the way to what he calls the essence of language. Because he, to be on the way to where the essence of language, one has to disrupt language in some sense, to open to what is speaking in and through language. And that is the, you know, in the very first days of my uh, lectures on Heidegger last week, I was talking about the, the way to language, Heidegger says, is um, to bring language to language as language. Die Sprache zu Sprache, zu Sprache bringen. To bring language to language as language. And that's happening here, although we're bringing the origin of language to language in this relation that he's trying to think of. That, that's the first part of this text. <laughs> then it breaks apart in a, in a very interesting way. But um, there, is a, there is a kind of passage that is being traced, but not in a linear narrative form. And one has to be extremely attentive to these breaks because, again, the, um, it engages a, a temporality which is more the temporality of return than the temporality of a, a linear movement. So he tells him to enter. He stays near the door. He is weary, and it is also a weary man who greets him. The weariness common to both of them does not bring them together. As if weariness were to hold up to us the preeminent form of truth, the one we have pursued without pause all our lives, but that we necessarily miss on the day it offers itself precisely because we are too weary. Almost a Beckettian sort of uh, dilemma, but this is the dilemma once this entire text will move. And as we learn, what has to be brought to speech is weariness itself in some way. We also glimpse here when they, they identify that themselves as equally weary, and as we proceed, um, it becomes difficult not to ask what, who is occupying what position in, at each moment. It, 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 at least there's a suggestion that these two figures are substitutable. They're both weary. They're both in the same uh, undertaking. And at least at the outset, we have a kind of, of scene set where one is in advance of the other in this process of, let's just call it dying, or in this fatigue. One is more fatigued than the other, it seems. And, and the other comes, this, the guest, comes to bring a kind of solicitude, or, 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 or bring a kind of support to the, to the other. And again, this is a, a repetition of these scenes of dying. One is, one is in advance in this movement, and 
um, and the other extends a hand. And this is occurring here. But as we proceed through this text, it, it's not clear who who is being talked about in in the uh, in, in the narrative, and it's not clear who's talking. And we start have to entertain, I think, the, the possibility that these these are these are substitutable figures, and as this dialogue plays itself out in this eternal repetition beyond the infinite conversation into the step not beyond, for example, where we see what looks like a version of the same dialogue. Um, the, these, these positions can, can, can be substituted for one another. So these are not identities, right? These, these are, um, these are uh, figures in a play which exceeds their initiative. They are, they are like markers in a game or tokens in a game. And, um, and this dialogue is the unfolding of that game. 